Hello and welcome back to The Expert Guide to Conspiracy Theories, a five-part series from The Conversations Ant Hill podcast. I'm your host, Annabelle Bly. Okay, so full disclosure. I don't consider myself to be much of a believer in conspiracy theories. At all. Maybe I'm too establishment. Both my parents are scientists and as one of the editors at The Conversation, I work with academics every day to share their expertise with the general public. If anything, I feel like I'm in an echo chamber of people who are not conspiracy theorists. And yet working on this podcast, I've realised that the people who believe in conspiracy theories don't always match up to the stereotypes. You know, like the sad guy that has no life and lives in his parents' basement spends too much time on Reddit and maybe wears a tinfoil hat. Polls show that most people believe in at least one conspiracy theory. Now, of course, there are loads of different conspiracy theories and people who believe in one don't necessarily believe in another, although at the same time, belief in one conspiracy theory is the best predictor of belief in other conspiracy theories. So in this episode, we're going to explore why people believe in conspiracy theories in general, and why people believe in particular conspiracy theories over others. We'll also find out whether certain types of people are more susceptible to conspiracy theories, and how things like the time and place that you live, who your friends are, and who holds political power influences whether or not you'll believe in conspiracy theories. First up, we are digging into the psychology of belief in conspiracy theories. Some scholars actually argue that our brains are hardwired to believe in them. My name is Jan Willem van Brooyen. I'm an associate professor of psychology at Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Jan Willem argues that the human brain has evolved to believe in conspiracy theories. The circumstances of hunter-gatherer life meant that our ancestors adapted to be overly suspicious. The theory underlying this is the idea that in ancestral times when we were all still hunter-gatherers, there was a lot of tribal warfare and a lot of conflict between different groups. And in such a setting, it can be adaptive and life-saving, actually, to be a little suspicious of groups that you don't know too well and coalitions that, uh, you know, might be powerful and might be dangerous. Therefore, we think that there is an evolved basis for the human tendency to easily distrust other groups, which I think is at the heart of conspiracy thinking. To survive, Jan Willem says, it was less of a risk to be overly suspicious and then be wrong than to be overly trusting. He compares it to seeing a shadow in the woods. If a hunter-gatherer saw a shadow in the woods, it could be from a rock or it could be from a predator like a tiger. If you assume it's a tiger but it's really only a rock, You may be mistaken, but it's a harmless mistake. You might have made an unnecessary detour, but you're alive. Meanwhile, if you assume it's a rock, and it's actually a tiger, and if you walk obliviously into the path of that tiger, that's going to get you killed. And this is just to illuminate that different types of mistakes that you can make don't uh, not necessarily have identical consequences. If you end up trusting a group that is out to harm you, and that has far-reaching consequences. That may be, you know, the end of it all. Whereas if you distrust a group and, for instance, avoid it, migrate elsewhere, uh, even though, you know, that distrust was unwarranted, then, you know, you have migrated elsewhere for no particular reason, but you are still alive. And that's a big difference. So ancestors who didn't have that, who were overly trusting of strange groups, were more likely to be taken out of the gene pool. Brutal. The problem humans face today is that modern society is very different to hunter-gatherer times. And being overly suspicious isn't such an advantage. We live in big societies. We're relatively well protected by a strong rule of law. Um, We constantly encounter different groups. And in such a pluralistic society, uh, such a different society, we still carry with us this ancient instinct not to easily trust groups that we perceive as different and, and, and that we don't know too well. Being overly suspicious of potential threats, a predisposition to believe in conspiracy theories, is what evolutionary psychologists call a mismatch. Another mismatch, Jan Willem says, is the way that humans are predisposed to liking food that's sweet, which in hunter-gatherer times indicated that something wasn't poisonous to eat. But today, a love of sugar can lead to tooth decay 
and obesity. There's a lot of rational things that we can do to suppress our instincts. You know, we can engage in rational thinking. Take the uh, appetite for sweetness uh, analogy. You know, we can rationally decide to not eat sugary foods anymore. And, you know, there's a lot of control that we can exert over it. But it's very difficult to just readapt and decide we don't like sweetness anymore. This is something that we're naturally inclined to do. The same issue, he says, goes for conspiracy theories. But as we explored in part one of this series, the thing about conspiracy theories is that there is something more to them than just suspicion. Believing in what we call conspiracy theories today is different to simply being suspicious of real plots that are taking place. With conspiracy theories, there's this way of talking about evil actors working behind the scenes. And a stubbornness. People believe this is going on, despite being presented with evidence to the contrary. Psychologists are also hard at work trying to figure out why people believe in specific conspiracy theories today, particularly when it doesn't often benefit them to go against the grain and believe in these often weird ideas. We argue that people believe in conspiracy theories for three main reasons. That is to satisfy three quite specific psychological motives. Karen Douglas is Professor of Social Psychology at the University of Kent. Like Jan Willem, she's part of the Compact Research Network of Conspiracy Theory Researchers, and she's spent the last 10 years or so researching why people believe in conspiracy theories. So the first one is what we would call the epistemic motive, that is a motive to be accurate and to have knowledge and clarity. And we find that that's kind of supported by other research findings, which suggest that people who are uncertain are drawn to conspiracy theories. People might not find what they are looking for in conspiracy theories, but it's that desire for an explanation and certainty when facing complex or unexplained events that draws people to conspiracy theories in the first place. The second one are existential motives, which are really kind of motives that are surrounding the idea that you want to be safe and secure in the environment that you live. You want to have control over the things that happen to you. For example, that people who um, feel that they're powerless and lack control, seem to be more drawn to conspiracy theories. People that are anxious in general are also drawn to conspiracy theories. The third big motive for people who believe in conspiracy theories is social. This is tied to our desire as humans to fit in and to feel good about ourselves. There's this kind of strong need to feel good about the groups that people belong to. And you do find that conspiracy beliefs are more likely to be prevalent amongst members of lower status groups because they're kind of trying to come to terms with that low status and trying to feel better, I suppose, about the group that they belong to um, and various things like that. One of Karen's colleagues has researched why people are socially motivated to believe in conspiracy theories. So my name is uh, Dr. Alexandra Cichotska. I work at the University of Kent, where I lead the political psychology lab and the master's program in political psychology. Alexandra has found that there's a link between narcissism and belief in conspiracy theories. Now, narcissists tend to believe that they are great, that others do not necessarily recognize their abilities and their greatness. And uh, therefore, they're usually convinced that other people are uh, basically out to get them and try to purposefully undermine them in their endeavors. It's simply because they generally are mistrusting of others. They tend to be paranoid and think that others might engage in actions that seek to undermine them. In one piece of research, Alexandra and her co-author Marta Markalewska found evidence that people who believe in conspiracy theories are also narcissistic at an individual level. So basically how they feel about themselves. They then made the same link with what they call collective narcissism. So in our research, we assume that as much as people can be narcissistic uh, about themselves, they can be narcissistic about the various social groups they belong to. So for example, they might believe that their uh, nation does not get the recognition that it deserves or that maybe their company they work for is amazing but others do not see it and do not appreciate it. As with people who are narcissistic about themselves as individuals, they found that people who were narcissistic about their group were more likely to believe in conspiracy theories about other groups or what are called outgroups. If they feel that their group is not 
appreciate it enough and is not getting its way, believing in an outbook conspiracy might help them explain why this is the case. Basically, they can blame other groups for their own group's misfortunes. They found this at play in one of their studies in Poland. So there are a number of conspiracy theories in Poland surrounding a plane crash that took place in 2010 near the Russian city of Smolensk. The president of Poland, along with his wife and some of the country's most prominent civilian and military leaders, were all killed when their plane crashed in western Russia. It was a Polish Fire Air Force plane carrying the, the Polish president, first lady and a number of top government and military officials who all died. It's clear why there were no survivors. Debris litters a swathe of the forest where the plane came down. Initial reports blame the pilot. Both the Russian and Polish official investigations into the crash found no technical faults and no foul play. There was thick fog at the time of the crash, and the aircraft struck some trees on its descent to the Smolensk airport. The Polish investigation found that the Air Force unit involved in the crash had major deficiencies in its training and organisation. But otherwise, there was nothing intentional about this tragedy. And yet, conspiracy theories have swirled around it since the day of the accident, claiming it was an act of war against Poland, an assassination of the president, an attempted coup, possibly orchestrated by Russia. Many of these theories are promoted by Poland's far-right Law and Justice Party. That's the party that's currently in power. One of Alexandra's studies was carried out in the aftermath of this plane crash. And what we found is that almost immediately after the crash, those who were high in collective narcissism were more likely to believe that there is a conspiracy behind this uh, plane crash and that it was not an accident, that some people, most likely uh, Russians, because the crash happened in Russia, were behind it. And we found that this was especially driven by perceptions of threat to the fate of the Polish nation at this time. They did other studies that confirmed this finding. So, for example, in another study, again, conducted with Polish participants, we looked at people's reactions to the celebrations of the fall of Berlin Wall. Now, in uh, Poland, some people believe that celebrating the fall of Berlin Wall uh, is taking away the recognition that Poland should receive for combating communism. And they think that the first three elections in Poland should be this event that marks the fall of communism. And we found that, again, collective narcissism was predictive of believing that other nations conspire against Poland to take away their credit for their fight with communism. So in different situations, they find that where groups think they deserve special recognition and maybe aren't getting it, this helps foster a belief that other groups are conspiring against them. Karen Douglas says there are also certain demographic factors associated with belief in conspiracy theories. There was a large epidemiological study done a couple of years ago, and they found that conspiracy believers were more likely to be male, unmarried, less educated, have lower income, be unemployed, be a member of an ethnic minority group, and to also have weaker social networks, which speaks to this social motive. So they kind of identify quite a lot of um, demographic factors that are associated with belief in conspiracy theories. Karen says it's important to note that the links here are correlational. The research doesn't say that having lower levels of education or income causes you to believe in conspiracy theories, or vice versa. They've established that there is a relationship there, but they are still working out the reasons why that relationship exists. It's also not the case that people who have high levels of income or education won't believe in conspiracy theories. That is certainly something that's true of the anti-vaccine movement. You find that um, a lot of people who are suspicious about vaccines and have these conspiracy beliefs that pharmaceutical companies are hiding information about vaccine efficacy and safety, these are educated people. So it isn't necessarily the case that all conspiracy believers tend to be lower educated. It's not the case at all. Context is actually very important. And, um, you know, again, I think a challenge for future research is, is going to be to try and tease apart when these links exist, when they don't, um, and how to kind of explain when the pattern kind of does go the other way. In part one, philosopher Kasim Kassam said that conspiracy theories are always political. 
and a person's political beliefs are also a factor in who believes in conspiracy theories. Psychologists have found higher levels of belief in conspiracy theories among people at the extremes of the political spectrum. People who are in the middle or, or not particularly politically committed tend to be not particularly believing in conspiracy theories, whereas people on the extreme left and the extreme right, and much more so on the extreme right, tend to be stronger believers. Karen says this link is well established. But again, it's hard to explain exactly why this is the case and what the exact relationship is. Whether conspiracy theorising is the result of a person's political ideology or vice versa. It's possible that the two feed each other. It does suggest that people who are kind of on the fringes politically or at the extremes do tend to gravitate toward conspiracy theories. And uh, you also find that independents and, and third parties also tend to be stronger believers. So you have this kind of marginalisation politically that might draw people toward conspiracy theories as well. Political scientists Joe Yusinski and Joseph Parent published the book American Conspiracy Theories a few years ago. It outlines how people who vote for the losing side in an election are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories than those on the winning side. I spoke to Joe Yusinski, who's an associate professor at the University of Miami, at a conference in Prague. We grabbed a few moments in the corridor between a busy schedule of academics sharing their latest research on conspiracy theories. So, to put it most simply, imagine one team wins a game and the other team loses the game. Who's going to complain about the referees in the game? It's going to be the losers, not the winners. It's the same with elections. Um, when one side wins, they think the election was hunky-dory. When the other side loses, they say, oh my God, we were cheated. It was all rigged against us. They found this to be the case for over a century of US politics, as power shifts between the Republicans and Democrats. So one way we do it on surveys is that we ask people before and after elections. So before an election, we'll ask people, if your side doesn't win, do you think that the election will have been the result of fraud? And in a normal election, equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans will say yes. But then after the election, that number cuts in half, because only the losing side will believe that they were cheated. They've been doing these surveys since the 2012 presidential election. To find out what public sentiment was like over the course of US history, they also analysed 120,000 letters to the editors of the New York Times and Chicago Tribune from between 1890 and 2010. And we looked over time to see who was accusing who of conspiring. And what we saw there was that as the presidency shifted back and forth between Republican and Democrat, the conspiracy theories did too. So whoever was in the White House, their side received the brunt of the accusations. So believing in conspiracy theories is not a partisan thing. It's like a pendulum that swings back and forth between left and right. I mean, when Clinton was president, Republicans were, you know, jumping up and down over Whitewater and he killed Vince Foster and, you know, we need to impeach him because of all of his crimes. And then he left and no one cared. And then the prominent conspiracy theories were Bush did 9-11 and Cheney and Halliburton and Blackwater, War for Oil... And then Bush left office, and those became politically sterile. And then we had Barack Obama faked his birth certificate. He's a secret Muslim. He's going to destroy the country. He killed the kids at Sandy Hook. And then he left, and no one cares about those things. And now Trump came in. Oh, Trump and Russia, blah, blah, blah. So you see that constantly where the losing side is sort of bringing itself together by having a narrative about this terrifying enemy who's in power. And the only thing that's different in the Trump years is that Trump does it too. Having a sitting president engage in conspiracy theories is a significant development. Instead of just having Democrat voters subscribing to conspiracy theories about a Republican president, for example, that Donald Trump colluded with Russia, you've now also got Republican voters believing the conspiracy theories that Trump pushes. 
I think that there'll be little change here. It'll go up, it'll get a little cooler, it'll get a little warmer like it always has for millions of years. It'll get cooler, it'll get warmer. It's called weather. I'm here to support my president. Why? He's supporting me. He's uh, uh, got out of the Paris Agreement, which I agree with 100%. I used to so work there's two the different NASA mechanisms at play. You so you can believe them because you're a loser, or you can believe them because your leaders are telling you that they're true. And so for Republicans, it's that Trump is telling them that these conspiracy theories are true. Joe says the idea that conspiracy theories are for losers is, to some extent, a good thing. It makes sense in a democracy that people out of power are suspicious of the people in power. It's there to act as a check on power. It's to be suspicious of those who, who can do a lot of damage with their power. That's not a bad thing. Um, of course, it can be corrosive, but it, it, at certain levels, it's not a bad thing. It's when the people in power start using conspiracy theories against people who don't have power that things can get very dangerous because the state can use its authority to hurt minorities or the most vulnerable. So think about what, what the Nazis did to the Jews or pick almost any genocide. It's done by people who are in power against weaker, vulnerable groups. And Trump's conspiracy theories are not unlike that, where he is attacking um, immigrants and minority groups. So he already has used the mechanisms of state to go after these vulnerable groups. Even beyond that, he could set expectations to a point where people may act where Trump doesn't. And we've seen that. We've seen people show up at shopping malls with guns and shoot, you know, Mexican invaders. So it is dangerous when the people in power use them. We'll also explore just how dangerous conspiracy theories can be later on in this series. The Ant Hill podcast is produced by The Conversation. We're a news website that gives a voice to academic experts from around the world. The Conversation is a charity. We don't have ads, we don't have corporate backing, and we don't have a paywall. Our support comes largely from universities, charitable institutions, and donations from people like you. If you'd like to invest in experts and help spread their message to a global audience, please consider donating. Go to donate.theconversation.com forward slash UK. That's donate.theconversation.com forward slash UK. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Annika. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine as well. Annika Rabo is an anthropologist at Stockholm University in Sweden. I called her up to get a slightly different perspective on studying who believes in conspiracy theories. Could you describe how you approach studying conspiracy theories and how anthropologists in general approach conspiracy theories and how that sort of differs to psychologists? Okay, we sort of immerse ourselves very often into the daily lives of people, either in a workplace or traditionally in small villages where people have face-to-face -face relationships. So that means that we don't approach conspiracy theories as sort of the center of our attention, but rather we become interested in, for instance, conspiracy theories as they appear when we're doing fieldwork. So Annika didn't set out to study conspiracy theories, but they came up so much in her years of fieldwork in Syria that she couldn't really avoid them. Everywhere in, in the Middle East, there has been, of course, in a sense, conspiracy talk about major international actors, that things are planned, everything is planned. People blame the United States, people blame Israel but people also blame their own regime. She calls it conspiracy talk more than conspiracy theories because of the fact that the talk she heard of there being a conspiracy was never very consistent. It often switched from referring to outside forces controlling current affairs to talk of conspiracies being carried out by the Syrian government. So people could sort of in one sentence almost move from blaming American imperialism to Israeli colonialism 
to the regime's machinations of doing evil things towards their own population. So it wasn't sort of, you know, neatly separated. And sometimes these evil agents, they were in cooperation with each other. You know, the the enemy from without and also the enemy from within were, were sort of collaborating. And sometimes they were seen as separate. This conspiracy talk would come up in all sorts of areas of everyday life. For instance, when there was a bread shortage, people would complain, also women, of course, you know, that this is, they are doing this to us on purpose. They're planning for us to concentrate on finding bread so that we will not uh, think about more important things in society. And that they, in this case, would then be the powers that be in, in Syria. It was a similar story if there were power cuts, and even when lots of people started getting satellite dishes in the 1990s. And the satellite dishes, they opened up possibilities to see, of course, television from all over the world, especially the proliferation of very many Arabic channels. And also channels from other places. Sometimes people would say, you know, we stay up all night and we watch television so that we're not able to do any work and we become so tired we cannot think of, you know, improving our lives and this is all planned. So it could either be planned from the regime, allowing people to see it, or it could be planned from outside that sort of force these television and satellite shows on people. This conspiracy talk permeated Syrian society in the years that Annika spent there prior to the civil war that started in 2011. In lots of ways, she says it served as a coping mechanism for people. It was a form of protest against a political regime they had little power to change. A way to make sense of a world they had little control over. It's also a way to to lament, why aren't we doing anything? Why do we accept this situation that we are in? And so I think that from that point of view, conspiracy talk is a way to work through social, economic and political dilemmas. And these dilemmas, they might look different in different countries and in different social situations. But I think that's also something that you find as a rather common theme in many, many places. Annika described how conspiracy talk shifted over the course of the Syrian civil war. In 2011, when the Syrian revolution started, it was a a watershed period in the sense that people were taking action uh, against a very, very corrupt and hated regime. And so I had the sense that conspiracy talk then diminished. So rather than talking people took action. Hmm. And that I sort of speculated, you know, the bad side effects of conspiracy talk that, you know, they disappeared and people were in a sense liberated and dared to take political action. But as the war continued and things got messy and more countries got involved, the conspiracy theory talk returned. Which is, of course, not surprising when you have regimes and countries being involved from all sorts of places where the political situation becomes very, very fragile and uncertain. So then, again, these conspiracy theories, they emerge and become even stronger. And on the other hand, the the Syrian regime has all the time kept its own take, its own conspiracy. Right from the start, they have had a, a special conspiracy narrative that they have been sticking to. When it comes to understanding why people believe in conspiracy theories, Annika has also coined this phrase, the importance of being important. Conspiracy theories help people explain why things are happening to them, particularly complex things that aren't easy to comprehend. Instead, they say it must be the result of evil people conspiring against them. And in the Middle East, um, you find this idea of the importance of being important. They're very prevalent And that feeds into conspiracy talk. We are a region in the middle of the world. Everybody comes here because they want something from us. Oil or, you know, our geopolitical strategy. You know, no conflicts are as important as our conflict. So this sense of being important is 
important to make you realize or to to make people think about who's after you, you know, what do they want from us? But it also at the same time, in a sense, gives a reason and explains the many disasters that happen to you. This is similar to what psychologist Karen Douglas was saying about the three main drivers for believing in conspiracy theories. The epistemic motive to explain things, the existential motive of feeling in control, and the social motive of feeling good about the group you belong to. But the specific conspiracy theories that people actually subscribe to will vary depending on the specific context that they are in, so the period and place they're living in. This is really important to recognise, says social psychologist Jovan Byford at The Open University. I would argue that conspiracy theories are actually least interesting as individual attitudes, as something that happens in a person's head. What is interesting about conspiracy theories is that they are out there. They're much more relevant as sort of a set of ideas that circulates in the public domain, that ebbs and flows. So sometimes they become more popular, sometimes they are less popular. It is in effect an ideological discourse, a way of making sense of the world. And it is one on the basis of which movements are established, political projects are forged, power relations challenged and sustained. People talk about conspiracy theories. They debate them. They engage with them socially, both online and offline. And the way they engage with them matters a great deal for society. So also conspiracy theories are very rarely something that happens in a person's head in the sense that it is not a question of an individual's belief. It is also a social activity. So my argument would be that instead of studying conspiracy theories as a question of individual disposition or individual characteristic, we need to look at how conspiracy theories as types of explanation, explanations that have their own history, that have their own ideological and political connotations, become perceived as relevant in particular social and political uh, contexts and how they suffuse everyday conversation about events in the world. So the conspiracy theories that Annika Rabo witnessed in Syria were quite different to those going on outside of the Middle East at the time. They were very much centred on the politics of the region and everyday life there. For example, she was keen to emphasise that the conspiracy talk she heard in the Middle East was different to a lot of the conspiracy theories you might think of in a Western context. Here's Anakur again. So in the Middle East, you don't find sort of aliens and reptiles and these sort of flat earth kind of conspiracy theories. But I think that perhaps, you know, aliens and UFOs and flat earth, it has no real bearing on, on people's, um, people's lives. So in order for, for these ideas to get a grip, there has to be a, a, a fertile soil in which they can grow. So while the elements of conspiracy theories are fairly similar, perhaps, you know, universally similar in the way that, that psychologists see, evil agents who will do things to hurt you, or to hurt your family or to hurt your country. These elements are very, very similar. But the kind of exact content of these theories or this conspiracy talk, this will differ because it has to be meaningful in the kind of society where you live. Jovan Byford says we also have to be mindful of the status that conspiracy theories are given in society. There's a spectrum of belief in conspiracy theories. Lots of people are not firm believers. They are simply conspiracy curious, as Kasim Kassam put it in part one of this series. The way that society treats conspiracy theories can influence this. Here's Jovan. Increasingly, what accounts for the popularity of conspiracy theories, for instance, is the fact that in the media, conspiracy theories are considered as not necessarily a normative of entirely valid explanation, but an explanation that warrants to be heard. Um, so, for instance, a few years ago on, on 9-11, uh, the Daily Mail published a two-page spread which entirely gave a voice to 9-11 conspiracy theories. They were not saying that they are correct, but they nevertheless treated conspiracy theories as an opinion that deserves to be heard. Equally, because people engage in conspiracy theories in different ways, we need to be careful about who we brand as a conspiracy theorist. We have to interrogate what do we mean by believing in a conspiracy theorist. 
People engage with conspiracy theories in a variety of different ways. Some do it in a fun way. Some don't take it particularly seriously. Others consider them to be an explanation to which they don't subscribe, but nevertheless as one that other people legitimately uh, believe in, and so on. And all this kind of complexity of the way that people engage in conspiracy theories and the role that conspiracy theories play in everyday life uh, gets completely obscured by the focus on conspiracy theories as an individual belief. For Jovan, it's more important to understand the historical context in which certain conspiracy theories emerge and flourish. The way that people thought about conspiracies in the ancient world or in the Middle Ages was very different to the way they think about conspiracies today. This political conspiracy, this idea of there being a vast international plot aimed at subverting national governments, uh, a way of life, democratic order and so on, the idea of people with financial power seeking control of world affairs and so on, is not a universal phenomenon. It is very much a historically contingent phenomenon that developed over the past 200 years, particularly since the French Revolution. Humans may be hardwired in some way to suspect other groups of doing them harm. There may have always been theories about conspiracies, some real and some imagined. But many researchers argue that what we recognise as a conspiracy theory today That refusal to engage with evidence or the received wisdom of the time, as Peter Knight put it in part one. This is a modern phenomenon, one that began to take shape in the 18th century. And it is this more recent history that we're going to dig into in our next episode, where we'll be exploring some of the most persistent and pernicious conspiracy theories of the last couple of centuries. Those surrounding the Illuminati and anti-Semitism this idea of a Masonic Jewish Illuminati plot to take over the world. So that's its its kind of new incarnation in the 20s. It's carried on some of the traditions that we've seen in the 18th century. It has also then um, combined it with this uh, anti-Semitic belief in a hidden Jewish cabal orchestrating world events. More of that on the next episode of The Conversation's Expert Guide to Conspiracy Theories. Subscribe to The Ant Hill if you haven't already to get it when it drops. And in the meantime, you can read more about the latest research on conspiracy theories on theconversation.com. Thanks to all the researchers who spoke to us for this episode and City University of London for letting us use their studios. Special thanks to Claire Birchall, Michael Butter and Peter Knight who've helped bring this podcast into being and to the Cost Action Compact for funding it. The Ant Hill is produced by me, Annabelle Bly, and Gemma Ware at The Conversation. Eloise Stevens is our sound designer, and we've got original music by Nita Saal. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>